Our final speaker this afternoon is Dr. Ryan Juniper. Ryan's a recent local FANSCA graduate with a special interest in open access education. Ryan's currently completing extended fellowship time at St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, and we hope to welcome him back to Perth shortly. Thanks very much. Maybe just have a stretch while I just get my presentation up. Thanks. Okay, so um, I've been asked to talk on the smartphone today, and uh, it's been alluded to quite a lot already in a few talks, so there'll be a, a, a little bit of overlap, but I'll try and keep those parts brief. Um, but as we know, smartphones are one of the most rapidly adopted uh, technologies in human history, and they've become really the center of this whole digital age. Uh, Smartphones and anesthesia uh, is, is an area that's largely free of high quality research, but I've included uh, papers along the way which I think have some relevance. Uh, so there's three main questions I'll try to address today. To what, what extent are anesthetists using smartphones? Might be an obvious uh, answer there for you. Uh, and what are the current uh, already realized applications of smartphones in the theater environment? What are the future functionalities for smartphones and anesthesia? Uh, and if time permits at the end, I'll just go over the evidence of, of what are the actual risks of having smartphones uh, in the clinical environment. Okay, so let's begin. So uh, smartphone usage, I think you'll all be um, slightly intuitively aware of the high rates of smartphone use in, in amongst anaesthetists. Most contemporary surveys are showing a rate of about 80, 90, 80 to 90 percent uh, smartphone ownership amongst anaesthetists, which, which is slightly higher than average uh, in the population. Uh, of that, about 80 to 90% of those use their device for accessing medical information in the, in the workplace, uh, which is phenomenally high. Uh, about 50% have medical apps, and there's a growing trend, uh, as is alluded to in the, in the social media talk uh, by Ben, about a growing trend for consuming digital content. And the smartphone is, is central to all this. So, so what are the, what's the actual utility of the smartphone? Uh, the, the, Capabilities of smartphones uh, and, the, and the applications is, is almost endless. Not, not all of these d directly translate to improvements in, in patient care, so I'm going to try and focus on um, three sort of themes in, in which all the, all the applications surround uh, and touch on what we can do already and, and what I think uh, is in the near future in terms of their applications. So uh, these are the three main areas, communication, information management, and performance enhancement. So direct communication is an obvious application of, of a phone. Uh, so calls and SMSs in, in terms of coordinating patient care in the perioperative period is something we're already doing. Um, but an area in which this will expand in, in the near future uh, is that of relating to our patients better uh, in the perioperative period. And as alluded to in, the, in a previous talk, is that this is being expected of us by the public, uh, and and we have uh, we're going to increase our our role in this regard in, in the in the near future. So that involves things such as preoperative consultation, telemedicine, um, uh, and uh, preoperative health data, which we'll, we'll get into in a second. Uh, second second uh, point is that translation is of. Uh, frequently a difficult problem in the, in the theatre environment. We, of, we often have uh, translators in the pre-operative period uh, before anaesthesia, uh, but this is difficult within the theatre environment and uh, we can use our smartphones to uh, assist us in this regard already uh, with an app called Communicate OR, which gives um, basic instructions such as take a deep breath and open your eyes and uh, to, to assist us in theatre in different languages. Um, but another uh, a role which I think will increase in the future is using our smartphones and our patients' smartphones to improve perioperative education uh, of, of the patient about what to expect for the, for the nature of their procedure and their anaesthetic risks and the nature of their recovery. Um, mobile friendly resources are not currently being exploited to a large degree uh, you know, for our patients' benefit, but, but this will change. Uh, and finally, post-operative feedback. So th this has already been piloted in Australia by, by uh, an anaesthetist, uh, uh, and that is getting post-operative data, outcome data, directly from our patients uh, through a survey links via SMS or, or whatever route. Uh, and the study's shown that uh, patients love to give us feedback on, on how we've treated them and managed them, 
uh, and their response rate is higher than traditional survey data, and, and this can form part of our CPD uh, requirements as well. Uh, second second uh, point in communication is indirect communication. So this is, email is obviously a well-established uh, route of communication, but uh, other facets of this role are increasing currently. So uh, departmental group chat or um, uh, um, private, private group chat via specific apps or via uh, organizational forums is, is beginning, are beginning to appear. So uh, one example is that of, of Yammer, which is a institutional social network for business purposes only. Uh, and that's being rolled, up, rolled out in some hospitals across Australia to improve uh, collaboration and cohesion amongst staff in, in hospitals and exploit all the benefits of social media. Uh, and uh, as was just mentioned, um, communication via uh, our smartphone devices on what is happening in theatre, not only to our own device, but in terms of supervising trainees uh, or as a duty anaesthetist, uh, supervising the theatre environment via remote anaesthesia machine monitoring. Uh, just briefly, uh, moving on to information management. Our smartphones are obviously very good at organising our own personal information and we're all well aware of the benefits of that. Uh, so I won't, I won't um, dwell on that, but I think it's important to note that um, from Bruce's talk this morning, that using our smartphones to actually help us achieve a work-life balance um, by using them in this manner in the theatre environment um, is not um, uh, of great, you know, it may, it may carry some risk to patient care, but, but is actually a valid use of our smartphones. And we'll, we'll talk about the risk of, of smartphones uh, shortly. Um, finally, um, in, in terms of information management, uh, as we just heard, there's a whole future ahead of us uh, of managing patient data in an integrated manner. Uh, um, and this can, this can all come down to um, tech that is driven by our smartphones and accessible to us through smartphones. So um, as Philip Lurk talked about before, the complete health record. So this is being achieved to some degree around Australia uh, with, with um, the embrace of electronic uh, medical records. But to have um, perioperative home monitoring of the patient's baseline data uh, available to us, the perioperative correspondence from all our, the multidisciplinary team available to us on our phones, real-time surgical list updating uh, accessible to our phones, and when we walk into theatre, the NFC chip on our smartphone, programming our anaesthetic machine with all our personal preferences of alarms and, and patient management. Uh, and follow, following this, tracking the patient via big data, giving us real uh, outcome data on how we've managed the patient and, 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 uh, uh, and, and comparing this to key quality indicators. So that's an area that is certainly not at, um, you know, has a, has a large presence at the moment, but will in increase in the near future. So I wanted to talk a bit um, now about performance enhancement uh, and how we can use our smartphones to improve our performance in, in the theatre environment. And this is the concept of, uh, of the extended mind. So the extended mind is um, active externalism in which objects in our environment, such as our smartphone, function as part of our mind. So cognition is offloaded uh, into the environment through either access to technology or already, as it already happens, uh, social or cultural um, practices within our theatre environment. So this, this is an active information retrieval uh, and it's the knowledge that the, uh, it, it's your understanding that, the, that the, the knowledge exists but you don't have it in your immediate memory but you know where to harness it and retrieve it for, for application in the workplace to the benefit of the patient. The next generation of um, anaesthetists are, gi are digital natives uh, and they are already doing this and will expect this role to increase in the future. Um, so I'll go quickly now just to, just to show some examples of that, of uh, examples of um, um, performance enhancement tools that are already being used and touch briefly on, on which ones will may increase in the future. So these are all accessed either via um, apps or websites or, or particular phone functions. So firstly, there's your personal reference, which, which through your own experience, you've documented things you, you want to refer to in the future, which we're probably all aware of. 
uh, Evernote and Apple Notes. Uh, then there's medical reference and guidelines, and the, the most prominent ones are the, the ETG, Electronic Therapeutic Good, uh, Guidelines uh, recommendations, including the antibiotic guidelines, uh, and other medical databases such as UpToDate and uh, Oxford Handbook. There's anaesthetic reference databases, so the Oxford Handbook of Anesthesia and the Westmead Anesthetic um, uh, uh, Book uh, and other anesthesia-oriented um, reference materials. Uh, and there's specific anesthesia guidelines uh, which are available um, via Apple website. And so the most prominent currently are the ASRA COAGS guidelines. Uh, and the ACCC, American College of Cardiologists, guidelines for perioperative management, uh, and the AAGBI guidelines. There's a whole host of um, pharmacology-based um, performance enhancement tools, uh, including MIMS and Frank Shan's drug doses, uh, and also some that allow us to study the pharmacokinetics of, of, of drug infusions that we give perioperatively. Uh, a special mention to the FPM opioid calculator, which was released recently which allows us to calculate the opioid re requirements for our patients uh, and, and have effective uh, opioid exchange or, or rotation. There's uh, applications in crisis management. So uh, the well-known anesthetic crisis manual uh, has a PDF available, which you can uh, access on your phone with, hi with hyperlinks uh, for use in a, in a crisis. Uh, and ALS also have their own iResus um, application. There's online databases which can help us to perform clinically, and uh, a couple of examples of these are Orphan Anesthesia, which is a database of rare genetic conditions and their influence uh, with anesthetics, uh, and um, the NAPOS uh, database, which is, which is a collection of drug safety in porphyria. Uh, most journals now ha have a smartphone-ready access. Probably the, the most useful one to know is QX Read, which the College of Anaesthetists has recently um, promoted. You can access all uh, anaesthetic journals subscribed to by the college uh, in a continuous feed on your phone with automatic PDF retrieval. Uh, it's a very powerful tool and um, uh, really uh, opens up the ac access to journals in an easy manner. And furthermore, for uh, um, re resources around the use of ultrasound, such as regional and, and echocardiograph. So all that, all that aside, the question is, do these aids really make a difference uh, to how we perform and, and patient outcomes? Or is, this, is the extended mind just a lazy, a lazy defense of the uh, addicted uh, smartphone addicted internet generation? Uh, I, th I think the answer is fairly clear that cognitive aids do aid performance. And um, there was a review on this recently in anesthesia and analgesia, uh, which, which um, stated so. Uh, in other areas uh, of human development, you know, uh, such as aviation and, and other specialties, um, peri uh, uh, internal medicine rather, um, the use of cognitive aids has been shown to directly improve performance and, and patient outcome such as management of, of pneumonia, for, for example. In anaesthetics, uh, there's a bit of a paucity of, of research, but this is probably one of the um, most significant papers uh, in 2016, where um, they looked at uh, assessing people's adherence to guidelines on um, regional anaesthesia and, and patients who are on antithrombotic medications. And they had 260 patients across eight hospitals, uh, and they had a control group who could use any reference available to them, uh, including memory, and they had um, the intervention group that used the ASRA COAGS guideline app, uh, and this is their results. Essentially, the control group adhered to the guidelines roughly 70% of the time, um, but those who used memory alone, about 60%, and those who used a performance um, support tool achieved, you know, 90, 90 to 95% um, adherence. So I thought just quickly I'd briefly talk about apps, uh, since that is the form that a lot of these performance enhancement uh, tools come in. There's over 165,000 healthcare apps in, in uh, the Apple Store alone, and over 1,000 a month are, are joining the party. The, this is obviously very difficult to um, monitor and uh, critique, uh, 
Uh, and so the FD FDA has essentially said uh, that they will only apply regulatory authority to those apps that are designed to control uh, patient uh, equipment that could pose a risk if that equipment malfunctioned as a, as a, as a, as a risk of the app. So most of the uh, examples that I've just shown that, that come in the form of an app are not regulated by any health authority and therefore the um, onus of validation of the tools really falls to the end user. Uh, but there are ways to uh, assess the reliability of, of these tools. Just quickly, in, in the future, virtual and augmented reality are going to start to become a big, a big player and uh, Apple is um, heavily, heavily investing in this tech and uh, as are other companies. And it has obvious uh, applications to improve performance in, in anesthesia. Uh, for example, in re regional anesthesia training or, or upskilling, um, vascular access procedures, fiber optic intubation and bronchoscopy, for example. So uh, we may look like something like this in the future. Uh, aug augmented reality guiding our clinical practice. Uh, but this is still a while away. And finally, just um, as was just dis discussed uh, earlier, the smartphone uh, may be the center of an environment in which um, comprehensive smart anesthesia systems uh, improve our performance. And that's not just uh, the presence of smart alarms, uh, but also the ability to control all drug delivery and ventilation via, via our phones or via a digital interface uh, with completely closed drug delivery systems that are based on, on plasma, uh, drug do uh, pl plasma levels. Uh, inbuilt into these systems will be all those aforementioned um, uh, applications of, of clinical decision support uh, to help us make um, uh, clinical decisions that, that are supported in real time by, by, uh, by guidelines and by, by what we know. Okay, so um, I thought I'd just quickly talk about uh, online education uh, as uh, the talk on social media uh, addressed essentially the social media side of, of online education, but there's more to it than this, and I think uh, the, the previous talk it was self-confessed, a bit pessimistic about the social media, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring the optimism. Uh, and just let you know about this uh, phenomenon called foam. So online education has gone through uh, a number of phases in, in history. It began in the early days of the internet with just online forums, online journal clubs and, and amateur productions. Uh, and then as the internet grew in popularity, f uh, formal governing bodies and institutions started to harness, harness the power. Uh, and started pr to produce um, credentialed online education courses. Um, the, the third wave, in, in keeping with the social media, the rise of social media, uh, is, is all about collaborative user content. So wikis, uh, blogs and sites, uh, podcasts, social media, and, and the latest uh, player is now open access medical journals. So it's this third wave which has really been um, termed uh, FOAM, free open access medical education, or that horrible word, medication. So I'll quickly just go through. The definition is somewhat nebulous and hard to grasp, but uh, this, is, this is what FOAM is, uh, and it's important to realize that it, it's not just social media, but it, it's more uh, the next generation of education w which harnesses um, uh, on, uh, online capabilities. So foam uh, is globally accessible uh, and it's crowdsourced and it's an adjunct to traditional education. It doesn't replace uh, our traditional teaching methods but, but supports it in, in a realistic way. It provides inline content uh, which is contextual to what you're doing in your workplace uh, and offline content which you consume in your own time. Uh, it augments traditional educational principles as I've, I've just uh, said uh, and this is the key, is it's not a particular site or app or anything, it's, it's an array of resources that are made free and unrestricted to all those who are interested in, in participating in ongoing medical education. It's all the resources and social forums and uh, social media uh, and the users themselves that are delivering free medical education online. Its main aim is to subvert the entrenched barriers to knowledge uh, acquisition that, that exist with traditional education uh, and really increase the dialogue in medical education, sp 
specifically on a global stage to, to really um, support collaboration. There's, there's no official media uh, leader. It's not a specific platform, but it's rather a, a community. Uh, and the content itself is crowdsourced, so generated by the user, uh, which come from a, a, you know, a mix of individuals around the globe. Uh, the standards are evaluated by the people using the, the, uh, the content. So this is um, DAS SMAC, which some, some of you might have heard of. SMAC, Social Media Now, has its own medical conference uh, called Social Media and Critical Care, and this year it was in, in Germany. Uh, and in keeping with the success you saw of the life in the fast lane, the, the critical care sphere have really taken to, to foam, uh, and, and it's really a, a global phenomenon. This conference sold uh, a capacity of 2,000, sold out in a, in a few minutes. So I'll quickly go over the, the strengths of foam uh, and the weaknesses, but I think on the whole, uh, as said before, it shouldn't be pitched against traditional education, but rather seen... Uh, as something that is happening and something that we need to uh, increase our control over to ensure that the credibility problems uh, and, and the strengths of the platform are really harnessed. So it's free, obviously, uh, very limited um, cost to entry since we all have smartphones and internet access is, is almost ubiquitous. It's open access, so not behind paywalls or logins. Uh, and it supports a, a modern and adult approach to learning. So asynchronous uh, in your own time and at, uh, at your own level. Uh, and the flipped classroom where you, you do most of your um, reading and research in your own time and then and work out application in the clinical environment amongst peers. Uh, it's got a high level engagement because of the, the media that's available online. Uh, and it supports collaboration across not just peers, but um, across hospitals, nations, and, and the globe, which, which really um, speeds up um, uh, progress. In, it also helps to share tacit knowledge. There's a lot in anesthesia that we know that can't be explained well in a textbook, and there's no time for in, in public um, lectures, but uh, is easily just, uh, translated in, in, uh, in online uh, media. And finally, it supports research um, by reducing the, the, the links between the researchers and the people who are, who are practicing medicine uh, by allowing direct content, uh, contact and um, discussion. But there have been a lot of criticisms, uh, as was highlighted earlier. There's a definite quali quality and credibility problem. Uh, however, this is in keeping with all disruptive technologies that upset the status quo uh, initially with low cost and, and low quality and then uh, improve in, in quality as they take hold uh, and become more, um, uh, more pertinent in, in the way people practice. Um, I should say the, the only way we can improve the quality and credibility of, of this medium is uh, by us uh, participating and ensure that content is, is, is good. Uh, another criticism is that, is that it may separate learners from primary literature, and obviously we all try and have a working knowledge of primary literature, but as was alluded to earlier, there's 16,000 new meta-analyses each year. It's, it, it becomes increasingly difficult to, to grasp the, the, the original research. Uh, and, and one of the strengths of FOAM is that we can distill and share actual meaningful research quite uh, effectively. Um, but it's important not to use foam purely as your, as your sole educational um, content. Again, there is a tendency to oversimplify knowledge uh, online. Uh, and with rapidly moving medicine and rapidly translated research, there's a risk to patients uh, if, we, if we take up novel therapies that don't, don't have the, uh, the stand of time to prove uh, their effectiveness. Uh, and as, as before, populism such as hot authors or hot topics such as airway at the expense of perioperative diabetes management is, is a real problem. Uh, and finally, monetization. There are costs associated with, with hosting content and, uh, and the role of advertising and medicine, uh, medical knowledge is, is a difficult one. But all, all the problems aside, th this movement is, is prolific. So in 2016, uh, there were 356 phone providers in emergency and critical care alone. Uh, and uh, more than 30 of them were, were recognised as high, high enough quality to be recommended in a formal journal setting. M most of these are around emergency and critical care, but they have a lot of anaesthesia-type knowledge uh, and a lot of 
an anaesthetists and anaesthetic trainees are using this, this uh, content um, uh, due to a lack of our own. Most specialty groups have their own. So Life in the Fast Lane we discussed already, but there's also Radiopedia, uh, Family Practice, Dermatology, uh, and, and now uh, harnessing the, the power of open access education, there is the, the rise of open access journals, um, which um, may help somewhat to deal with publication bias by allowing a lot of negative trials, which are considered uh, still to be of high scientific rigor to be, to be published uh, and open to the scientific community. What about anesthesia? Well, largely we're a bit behind the ball game at the moment. Initially, we um, uh, took up the internet quite effectively and rapidly, but I think we've been overtaken. There's many high quality resources that are being published by professional associations within anesthesia, such as the British Journal um, of uh, Anesthesia Education and NISORA, Anesthesia Tutorial of the Week, and, and, and so on. But most of these are essentially um, authority bodies pr producing content, and it doesn't actually reflect much of the mantra of, of open access commentary and dissemination of, of new research. What we do have is, is also doesn't quite fit the bill in terms of the Black Bank Wiki, which is wildly popular amongst trainees, which is essentially an exam passing um, collaboration. Most um, people that have tried to maintain blogs or sites have, have abandoned them. Uh, podcasts are pretty sporadic, and Twitter's pretty lonely in, in anesthesia world. ANSCA's tried to address this and, and create networks, but it's behind a login and it has difficulty with its interface and it hasn't really been embraced. This is an example, you know, it's not just social media, but here's an example of your search terms you could use in Twitter, foam or foamed, just using Boolean search terms, uh, and anesthesia, and you can see someone has um, shared the BMJ's latest perioperative guidelines for, for patient investigation. We're well positioned to exploit foam in anaesthesia and, uh, and smartphones uh, are prominent in our, in our group and available clinically, uh, but we need to really take control of this space to improve its credibility. Uh, people within our community are gonna start taking this mantra up in, in, in the coming years and we need to support them um, by participating in online discussion uh, of, and, and discussion of research in a, in a, in a credible manner to really um, uh, 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 improve the quality and credibility of, of this tool I I online. Uh, it's only three minutes remaining, but I'll quickly go through just a quick analysis of, of the risks of having a smartphone in theatre. And basically they boil down to these. The transmission of communicable diseases. So if we took 100 smartphones and anaesthetists, 90% of them would be contaminated with some form of bacteria. And about 9 to 25% have pathogenic bacteria uh, for humans including multi-resistant organisms. So what do we do about this? 85% of us don't clean our phones to any regular um, rhythm, uh, and our smartphone providers have warned us against using decontamination stuff uh, in hospitals such as alcohol or chlorhex because it destroys the coatings, the oleophobic coatings on our, on our devices. The main thing is that we just observe the, uh, the five moments of hand hygiene, which is impossible in the, in the theatre environment, but to, to recognise that your smartphone is a fomite and, uh, and that you can mitigate the risk of communicating disease um, by you know, breaking that barrier with hand hygiene. Uh, interference with medical equipment was historically of great concern, um, but with modern technology, this is really um, changing. So first generation devices uh, had a high rate of, of uh, interference. But modern 4G and the next um, standard 5G, which will allow us to have driverless cars, uh, are of very low risk for interference. So this study looked at second generation and third generation devices, and the median distance for interference in those was three centimeters away from the, the patient or the equipment. That was with a supercharged transmitter um, device. So this is an artificial number of, of incidences, but it's just to show um, that devices are getting much, much safer. The worst recorded uh, interference was the sh complete shutdown of a, of a ventilator because of a smartphone. Um, equipment standards have also increased dramatically, so they're much better at screening and filtering out interference, but we still need to employ some caution because case reports are still, still being published. Uh, patient confidentiality can be um, compromised, and there's specific apps designed for this purpose, it seems. 
uh, where you can share images from your clinical workplace and discuss them amongst the medical forum of authenticated doctors, but, but this is still a, a pretty uh, murky area. A hospital in the States lost an iPhone with access to hospital data and was fined $650,000. The reverse is also true, our, our um, conversations which we think are confidential may not even be confidential. So a, a patient recorded um, what they thought were going to be post-operative instructions by leaving their phone under the bed during an endoscopy and managed to um, receive $900,000 in, in damages after the anaesthetist uh, said untoward things to them under anaesthetic. And finally, uh, distraction. So anaesthetist vigilance is one of our core tools uh, and is required for safe anaesthesia. And smartphones can obviously in, in, introduce distraction to the anaesthetic environment. There's a lot of examples of this, both in other um, industries, but also within anaesthesia. Uh, for example, this anaesthetist who uh, was sued after not realizing the patient was apneic for 15 minutes while reading his iPad. So although rare, you know, smartphones are a distraction uh, and do need to be kept in mind uh, that we need to have spare cognitive capacity uh, at hand if we're gonna, if we're gonna use them. Uh, here's a study which is, not, is fatally flawed but looked at intraoperative non-record keeping activities by anaesthetists uh, and correlated that to hemodynamic variability to, pr to prove that um, smartphones uh, didn't contribute to poor patient management. Uh, and uh, as alluded to before, uh, this is the Yerkes Dodson law, which says uh, perhaps when we have less complex tasks in anesthesia, such as uh, long cases where vigilance is, is fatiguing, introducing another, um, another uh, task, such as using your smartphone, may actually improve your vigilance performance. Okay, so I'll just stop there and, uh, and conclude. Um, that essentially, uh, in terms of risks, smartphones have potential risks in, in a number of areas, but we, we have ways that we can personally mitigate all, all these risks for safe anaesthetic care and, and to harness the benefits of, of a smartphone in, in the theatre environment. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all three of our speakers for a very interesting and insightful session. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes for questions, so I don't know whether anybody's got, we can get the speakers up to the stage and we can ask questions which they can answer from up here. Um, I've got a question for Ryan. Um, Ryan, just in terms of these open access education courses that they're now offering and it's so available, do you think they're going to detract from formally paid courses that uh, people are traditionally doing online? Uh, so, sorry, um, so for example? Well, you think about the, you know, the echocardiology courses you can do and the perioperative medicine, sure. Monash, yeah, yeah. university-based yeah. courses and those kind of things. Yeah. If the stuff is now being offered free, are people more likely to do those and less likely to yeah, so, uh, pay for courses? Good question, and definitely the uptake is high of, of online ed education modules. Um, but again, I think, uh, you know, I don't think traditional education avenues are really being challenged by the, by the rise of online education. I think they're, they're purely as an augmented um, capability at the moment. So uh, doing an $850 ECHO course online through a, through a university in Melbourne probably won't uh, substitute for a formal diploma in, in, in ECHO for a, for a cardiac anaesthetist. I think, um, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's, it, it serves a different clientele, I think. Um, there's a question from the interactive poll with regards to uh, the name of the app that we use to monitor your use of social media, please. <laughs> Which one is that? Um, so that would be... The, the one that you can use to monitor how much you use it. Uh, I think it's called break free, but there, that was a particular example, but there's a lot of examples of that. Um, the other thing I'd say, just to, to pick up on something Ryan said, was um, I did read my uh, <laughs> presentation last night, and, and it did look rather negative, and 
Um, I didn't want it to come across that way. I think the amount of opportunity in social media is immense. Uh, and if used in the right way and harnessed in the right way, uh, I think it can have both positive outcomes for ourselves as individuals uh, and as a profession. Uh, and I think one, one of the ways I see it working best at the moment is when social media is used to propagate uh, traditional media. Because there's no point in something sitting in a journal and no one reading. But now you're getting these really rich discussions from people who are at the top of their game, mixing with people at the bottom of their game. Um, and I think that's only going to be beneficial for everybody. Are there any other questions from the audience? I can't see. Thanks. We'll conclude the session there then. Um, thank you again to all our speakers very much. We appreciate your contribution to the conference. And thank you for visiting us here in Perth.